Hello and welcome to another edition of History Science Fiber. I'm Zoe McDonald, I'm a biologist, and today we are dying with the birch tree, this time with our native species, known as the paper birch, white birch, or canoe birch. Scientifically, it's the Betula papyrifera. Now, last time we used the leaves, so I'll leave a link <laughs> below in the description. This time, though, we're after the bark to see whether we truly can get a pink from it. Let's dive in. So first off, what do birch trees look like? They're considered small to medium sized deciduous trees, which can grow up to 30 meters or 100 feet. The bark peels off in these papery strips, which can be white to a coppery brown. Now the bark is also smooth and marked with these horizontal lines of raised pores. The leaves are green, they're paler underneath and relatively small, oval to round with doubly toothed margins. Uh, in young trees, bark can be hard to tell the difference between birches and bitter cherries, so double check the leaves. Now, the sap or resin has been used as chewing gum for over 9,000 years, not to mention all the incredible things that can be done with the bark, such as boat building to basketry, from jewelry to regalia. Birch is an incredibly important tree to many cultures all over the world. So when I first started dyeing with birch bark, I thought it was this exterior, this outer bark that's white, but that is not the case. This does not hold the dye potential that you're looking for. Instead, it's this inner part. That's called the cortex. This is the part that holds the dye that we're gonna use today. Now, I wanted to show you what happens if you do dye with the outer bark, because that's where I started, and I wanted to show you exactly what happens. So the first time I tried to dye with it, I cut up the strips, so I pulled the strips apart, and I weighed this outer bark to fiber. And I think I used about a 10 to 1 bark to fiber ratio. Now attached to this outer bark, you can still see there is cortex, but not enough to do what I actually needed, not enough to get the color that I was looking for. So when I'm usually dyeing, I add this paint bag. They're available at the paint store. They're really inexpensive. I reuse them every time. Um, and what doing this allows is you can put your material right in. You can heat it, you can process it, however you're gonna dye with it, and then pull the bag and the material out, and now the dye vat is ready for your fiber. It's just a really easy way to save the work of decanting and filtering that a lot of people do. Now from this step, the rest is fairly easy. You're gonna wanna add water, and you're also gonna add a little bit of chemicals that's gonna increase your alkalinity or you're gonna increase your pH. That's what you need to get the most out of your birch bark. And I use washing soda. So I added the water in, and now I'm gonna add about a quarter teaspoon of um, washing soda. So once the water was added, um, I wanted to leave it to ferment, to sort of get soaking. Um, and I added about a quarter teaspoon of washing soda and that's gonna increase that alkalinity. And then from there, I just waited about three weeks. Um, I put in my fiber, trying to get that pink. Um, and then I left it, I think for about a week. Um, but again, I didn't get the results I wanted. So I'm gonna show you next exactly how to get pink from birch bark just by making a few simple adjustments. So for this next part, you can harvest bark, let's say from a downed tree. So over those three weeks, I did see quite a color shift from more of a white into a deep pink. So I knew the color was there. So you have two options. You can either scrape off the cortex yourself and dye with that, or you can order birch bark cortex online. As you can see, the results were not quite what I was hoping for. So let's try it again, this time just using that cortex. So we have ordered it already chopped up. So we're gonna open it up and see what we have, what it looks like. Um, okay, cool. So it's all, we'll have a look. It's all the inner bark. It smells good. It smells like, well, it smells like woods and trees and that's exactly probably what it should smell like. Okay, we're gonna try, here's our birch bark from Deckle Dyes. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, there's our chopped up inner bark. Looks great. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is weigh out our fiber. So, let's make sure we're in grams, there we go. So 21 grams. So in one jar, we're gonna put 21 grams 
of birch bark and then the other jar we'll put 42 grams so we'll have a one to one jar and a two to one jar i think that should give us something okay so the first thing we want to do is tear the weight that's not the right button i do that every time tear that set it back to zero okay let's get 21 grams of it let's see what my kids have added Four grams, eight grams, 12 grams, 15, 19, 21. Okay, oh, 22. Well, let's be scientific about this. Okay, 21 grams. You can see what that looks like. Okay, so we're gonna use a paint bag first. These are one gallon bags. I just reused them from the paint store and it's gonna go into the jar. So the first thing we wanna do is grab all of this, put it into the bag. There we go. And then we're gonna put the bag into the jar. And then when we add our water and heat it up, we're gonna heat the water then for an hour, I mean, after leaving it overnight. And then we're gonna pull it out and then we can just put our fiber in without it getting all tangled up in the material. So that's our first jar. And in our second jar, we wanna put 42 grams. So we're gonna tear this again. Oh, no need. Okay, and now we're gonna go for 42 grams. Here we go. There we go, 42, 43, yeah, close enough. 43 grams, okay. And so we're gonna do the exact same thing. I'm just putting it into the bag. And then putting the bag into the, oop. Okay, so that extra stuff can go right into the jar. I'm just gonna scrape it off the table here. Because it's so fine, it's gonna go in through the bag anyway. And in it goes, okay. So we have jar with one, one, and it's twice as much as the weight of fiber. Now, we wanna put these in, I have some water. Let's do room temperature, cause it's gonna sit overnight anyway. Okay. Let's see what happens here. And sometimes you gotta watch the bag because it slips. Now we have to add our washing soda. So the question is how much to add? Um, I know about a quarter teaspoon will be about, change it to a pH of about 11. And I think I just wanna sprinkle is what I've heard. So I was thinking about adding in maybe half a quarter teaspoon, so an eighth of a teaspoon, basically. So an eighth of a teaspoon, like that. Um, maybe I should have done that before. Give that a little stir. Dry it off. Have another half teaspoon onto this one. Now what would be good is um, if we can, I'm gonna give these a little stir and see if we can sink that batter in. And then leaving that to soak overnight should, in theory, allow this matter that's sitting at the top to start getting down because it's not doing as much good if it's just going to sit on the surface. Okay. Oh, it's a good color. That's a good sign. Okay. We're going to leave these overnight and we're going to die with them tomorrow. So here are the two jars and I just wanted to go over quickly the fiber that we're going to be dying. So this is wool fiber. Um, it's the same on both sides. So these two have been mordanted already with 15% aluminum potassium sulfate, or also known as alum. Um, and mordanting with alum is an extra step that you put in. And generally speaking, it allows the yarn to go as dark as the dye bath. 
Um, if you're having a problem with natural fiber and dye and you're getting really, really weak colors, uh, suggest looking into Mordant. Um, that can really add something. Um, and then these two have already been treated with iron. 6% weight of fiber um, of iron. So same thing, you just, um, you can pick up ferrous sulfate online or you can make your own with rusty nails. Um, and it's just a solution to introduce the fiber to dissolved iron ahead of time. It does darken the fiber as you can see, but when we start dyeing with it, you can really see how dark those colors can get, including with some dye materials into a true black. For example, logwood will give you a true black. Um, so there we go, they're gonna be the same in each. So we've just have one jar with twice as much to see if this will give us some darker colors, but we're gonna leave it overnight and see what we get. Here's the first jar that has 21 grams and you can see it's turned sort of a ruby, orangey, peachy color. Here's the second jar with twice as much bark, 42 grams, and it's just sort of the same rich, dark, ruby orange talk pH for a second. Uh, there's two things to keep in mind. One is if you need to adjust the pH to get the color you want out of your material, uh, first you need to shift the pH and you also want to make sure that the pH remains shifted throughout and generally during dyeing it will want to go back to more of a neutral amount around the pH of seven. So I found the most inexpensive way to keep checking your pH is with pH paper as opposed to pH strips. So here I've just taken two little pieces of pH paper and I've checked, uh, checked the pH using chopsticks and it's a little bit low. What I'm looking for is a pH between nine and 11, really between nine and 10. Once you get up sort of to 11 and beyond, it's too hard on the wool. Um, so that's what you're aiming for is between nine and 11. So I like using washing soda for a couple of reasons. I find that it's quite stable, the shift. It doesn't create the kind of fumes that ammonia does. The only thing to note is that once you've added, it can take a few minutes for the pH to really do the, sort of that big shift. So just give it a second. So we're gonna check the pH now and hopefully it's around about a 10. Um, we sort of want it in that nine to 10 range. So it's looking good. So there's a 10 there and how about on the other side? Okay, so we've got it both at 10. These are now ready to go. So we're gonna put them in our pot, which is in our sink and we're going to add the water around it. So you can add the hot water. And the nice thing about this double boiler method is that the water in the pot can boil if you're not watching the stove too closely, which is okay, um, because the water inside the jars is not gonna boil. It's just gonna simmer. That's the one of the big advantages of the double boiler method. So now we're gonna take it. Once the water is at about two thirds full, this is looking good. You do want it slightly below the water level in the jars to make sure the jars don't tip over. And let's then take it over to the stove. So now we're over to the stove. We're gonna put it on and we're gonna let it heat up to a simmer about 80 degrees Celsius. And we're gonna let it heat for that one hour. Um, now let's talk about our fiber. You always want to soak your fiber ahead of time. I tend to soak the alum and the uh, sorry the alum and the iron separately because I don't want that iron to contaminate the color of the alum. Um, so I untangle the skeins. I give them a little bit uh, sort of manual. I'm trying to get those air pockets to leave. You want to soak it for about 20 minutes to one hour. And what that does is it allows that fiber to sink into the pot and then dye more evenly. So it's really worth the step. If you don't do this step and you add dry fiber, it just tends to sit on the surface. So I've got the two jars here and I'll let them soak for at least 20 minutes, though ideally about an hour. And then they should be all ready to go. So back to the stove, our bark is now simmering away. You want to put a timer on for one hour and allow that fiber to sink in and cool and then remove it from the bags. And this is the big advantage of the bags. You can just lift them up with your birch bark, allow that bark to cool and then go straight into the composter. And now those vats are ready for the fiber. That's one of the reasons I really love these paint bags. They're so great to use that way. So in the fiber, we're in the fiber goes. So we're going to add one alum and then one iron into each. And we're going to see if we can get that pinky color, which I'm really excited about. So in goes the alum, in goes the iron, and the same thing on the other side. Then we're going to allow those to heat and simmer for about an hour. And then we're going to leave it overnight to cool. 
This seems like a good time to talk about temperature. When you are dyeing for a project, often with a lot of fiber, you wanna be really careful with your temperature bridges. Allow things to cool overnight, allow things to heat up slowly, really take care of your fiber. If there's big temperature shifts, you can lose the luster in the wool and it can start felting. With these smaller samples, it seems to matter a little bit less. So here we go. We've got, we're starting to get kind of a peachy pink, which is exciting. Um, and now we're just gonna let it cool overnight. Have a look, the iron is still looking pretty brown and that alum is getting the pink. So I'm really excited to see what we get in the morning. Here we are as if by magic the next morning and the fiber is ready to come out. Um, I'm just gonna take the jars over. Oh, before I do though, once you're playing around with the pH, it's really important to double check the pH level, especially if you're gonna handle the fiber without any gloves. So I just wanted to do a quick check and the, the pots are still at about a nine, which is a great amount. Um, but sometimes if it's too low, you will, you will wanna do a pH shift to make sure that uh, you're getting the color that you wanted. Okay, so here we go. We are gonna take a look. Um, as you can see, when I actually started rinsing, a lot of that color did come out, but it did retain uh, that peachy pink, which is what I was expecting, and I'm really happy that we got it. You can see it is a really far cry from the color or the lack of color we got from that original. So that's the one-to-one -one alum. Now we're gonna check the one-to-one -one iron. Um, this one stayed pretty brown. It didn't shift very much. Um, so I don't know if that's really worth doing. It's not much of a uh, color change I mean, a little bit, but not, not a lot. So let's check the two to one jars and see if adding twice as much cortex really did shift the color. So here's the, here's the alum warranted, but again, it's got to rinse out because a lot of that color is going to come out. But I do think it did shift to a bit of a darker pink. It's quite noticeable. Um, and also once it's dried, it does retain that darker pink color. So um, I think if I was looking for a darker pink, I probably would dye with that two to one. Um, and then again with the iron, taking a look, it did come out more of a slate gray with some brown and hints of pink. So that was quite a color shift again. So we ended up getting two shades of pink and two shades of brown. Um, I'm gonna show you some photos of exactly what, what it looks like. And here we go. So the one-to-one -one is on the left, the two-to-one is on the right. Um, and then I had a little trouble getting the pink to show up in photos, so I did take it outside and photograph it. And as you can see, these are the colors. I'm super happy with it. Would definitely recommend exploring birch bark for dyeing.